been talking an awful lot. We write a lot. We've been doing podcasts. We have uh, a lot of communication with clients and potential clients about best practices and what you should do and what you could do and how to make things very, very effective. And yet sometimes it's illustrative and useful to think about what not to do and think about mistakes you've made. To help us look at it from that skewed perspective, we have Sean Matthews, President and CEO of Physix. Hi, Sean. Hello, Derek. Thanks for having me here again today. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Sean, for coming and talking. And thank you, everybody, for listening. This is Digital Signage Done Right. Whether you're new to digital signage or a seasoned pro, this podcast gives you practical advice about systems, communications, and content to better engage your audience. I'm Derek DeWitt, Communications Specialist for Physics. Welcome to Digital Signage Done Right. What are some ways I can really screw up a digital signage deployment? Tell me tell me how to fail. So it's funny <laughs> because, uh, you know, before we... we we started talking here, we sat down, I kind of made some notes like, all right, what's our number here? And I, I could come up with 13 based on some things that we, okay. that we, that we talked that's, about. That's, that's an inauspicious number. That's <laughs> yeah. perfect. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, digital signage systems can be, they can be complex because if you think about, uh, it's a mesh of technology and communications, which are two different things. You know, it's IT people, left brain versus right brain, you know, kind of things. And two different parties are often responsible for making it work, not just technologically speaking, but how we communicate. And so no one's really usually to blame for like the bad digital signage stuff. But over the years, you know, we see a lot of systems that get installed and everybody's fired up and they're excited. And some people even go so far as to cover the displays with like brown paper and it's printed on the front coming soon, you know, that kind of stuff. And they peel, <laughs> they peel off the paper. You that's, know, that's so, so it's kind of cool. Yeah. They start off with all this excitement. And then I go back six months later and I'm like, hey, man, what do you think? It's okay. You know, like, uh -huh. ew, you know, it can't just be okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we don't but, make an okay product. That's correct. And so, you know, how it's used, um, definitely it's important. And so, okay. you know, I thought about the number one thing that, you know, starts with the physical deployment and that's just bad placement of the screens. Mm. And the most common problem I see is placing the screens so high up, you know, way above hallway intersections and particularly big hallway intersections where the screen kind of gets dwarfed by the gap between the top of the door frame and the ceiling above. And, you know, some people say, well, we put that there so that people can't jump up and touch it. Well, I can see that maybe. Is I'm that like, really that big a problem? I, you know, I wonder. <laughs> I really do. But, you know, placement is bad. And um, that's a problem. And, of course, tied to that is, you know, if you have placement that doesn't meet ADA guidelines, particularly when... Uh. You know, it's for interactive type of things, right? And that's um, that's certainly a, a problem. So screens at eye level, that's you know just a little bit higher. That's where you really want them. Um, the second thing that's a common thing that, that people do that ends up not really helping out in the situation is using audio where you shouldn't. So we've all been someplace where, you know, CNN or Fox News or something like that is just running all the time. And we know that it's the same story slightly modified right, right. over and over and over again. And so that's really challenging for people that work near those displays. And so if you're not using like dome speakers or something that channel the audio to the area just in front of the display, you know, having just ambient audio fill the space, it doesn't do anything to attract viewers and in fact annoys people in the space around them. So that's that's a challenge. Um, and you know, you never really want to incorporate loops with, you know, short little loops with audio clips associated with them because it becomes so repetitive that it's even worse than the news story being repeated every 30 minutes, right? Right. Another one, of course, that, that happens is there's just too much going on screen. Mm. And we've all seen this where if you turn to Bloomberg News or Bloomberg Television and the tickers are going in opposite directions because, <laughs> you know, they represent different markets or different countries or whatever, right? Yeah. There's so much going on. And I guess, you know, if you're a financial trader and that's what you do for a living, all of that information simultaneously might be useful. But for those of us that are passing by a sign in a lobby. Thinking about something else. Yeah. I can't get anything out of that. It's overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a bunch of noise. So right. that's another another failure point there. So audio noise and then visual noise. All right. Yep. 
another one that uh, that we run into are just poor quality of images mm. in you might not be able to employ a staff of people to create really high-end artwork all of the time, but you could hire people and or outsource the creation of templates that allow people to fill in the blanks and those kinds of things that look good because the associated artwork is really well done, right? Yeah. And so I'm just kind of filling in the text blanks of you know welcoming our most prominent visitor or our best client or what have you. But it's, you know, I'm just there filling in the blanks and the artwork makes it, it really sell. Now, what do you say the, the person B cre- is creating these messages and um, she thinks they look awesome. She thinks that bright green text on an orange background is awesome and that Comic Sans is amusing and charming. What do you, uh, what do, you do? <laughs> well, you, you really have two, <laughs> two choices or so two options. You could certainly enroll that person in some classes that Give are training. Yeah, associated uh-huh. with um, graphic design. You know, not everybody can be a master of Photoshop, but PowerPoint is certainly you know much more user friendly, and mm. you know, very, most people are very familiar with that than that work in uh, organizational environments. So you know, providing some basic guidelines and techniques for contrast and color and style. You might be able to help train or educate that person into what might look good on this medium versus what they think looks good personally, right? And right. so you kind of take it away from their um, lack of understanding, you know, or artistic preference, but focus on the medium and what looks good on this medium. Right, because if it looks good, even if it looks good in print, it might not translate that well to digital science. Yeah, most right. definitely. And okay. of course, beyond that, you could add restrictions that don't allow them to publish until you approve it, but then that puts you in the middle of this yeah. approval process. Right. Stifling them. Yes. Yeah. I mean, to what you just said, you know, no contrast could be a problem. You know, that's another common thing. We see a lot of deployments where the artwork just doesn't have a lot of contrast. You know, it looks very artistic, but there's not enough visual contrast to convey the message. You're trying trying to win an award. You're trying to communicate that there are cookies at the cafe. That's correct. And, you know, and you also get you also get this with uh, like a lot of people are something like 8 percent of American males are colorblind or have some kind of colorblindness or born with it. Most of them are red, red, green. And people mistake it. They think it means that they see gray. They don't. It means that between red and green, the eye has a hard time differentiating. So like, yeah, red text on a green background may say Christmas to you, but to a colorblind person, it's just a smear of confusion, you know? And you also get the same thing. It's like, well, I have red, but then darker red. To someone who's colorblind, there's no difference because the other thing is they can't differentiate between shades of a particular color. So that's another yeah, thing so, to think I mean, about. Contrast is, is key in terms yeah. of this, this medium. A lot of people talk about this, and even we talk about, you know, the fact that you can incorporate animation or movement on digital signs, which is an advantage to printed signs. The problem is, is when you start adding all kinds of just quirky animations, you know, if you can rely on the transitions and the platform that you're using, you know, that adds animation itself. Yeah. You could certainly incorporate some some video backgrounds, which are subtle movements. You might uh, reflect on the same subtle movement that you see when you look at a weather app on your mobile device. When it's raining outside, you see the little subtle, you know, raindrops on the backside of your, your screen or yeah, yeah, clouds yeah. in the background or whatever. And so that sort of subtlety works. But when you just start adding animation for the sake of animation, it just becomes this awkward thing that appears. It starts to look like a morning children's TV show. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, other things that are, you know, more important, and we see this all the time, and these I'll kind of lump these three together. It has to do with how you communicate and what you communicate. So not knowing your audience, being completely out of touch, let's say with millennials, for example, and you're, yeah. you're conveying messages that don't really make sense to them. Retirement plans. Yes, retirement <laughs> plans would be one, right? Um, or, you know, no tailored content. It's just generic content. You know, it's like, we're the Acme Corporation and we're great. Like, that yeah. doesn't really say it. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It becomes your yeah. I'm going to tune it out, you know, uh, pretty soon. And then, of course, no call to action. You know, I kind of put all these together because you're out of touch. It's boring and there's no real call to action. Well, right? how can you have a call to action if, you, if, you, if you're being so generic? You know what I mean? We're great. What am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. I mean, that's, and so those three together, you know, really add up to being things that can create failure in a very short period of time. Sure. And I think you get this with localization too. Yes. Uh, you know, the corporate office in, let's say, Boston 
sends out all this information and a lot of the information they're sending out is completely irrelevant to the Seattle branch or whatever. You know, it's like the Seattle people would like to, to have things that are relevant to what they do and in their area. And let's not even talk about international companies where different languages, different cultures, Oh, you think that means this? Well, not in this culture. Right. It doesn't. It means something rather rude. Yeah, and I mean, the, the simple you know, representation you just used then, you know, the people in Seattle don't really care that the company has tickets to the, um, you know, the Mets playing at the Red Sox in Boston yeah. because uh, ooh, we, ooh, we, we just, can't go. I'll just go right on. I'll just hop on a plane. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've got just like four more here. Okay. But really, three of these I would lump together as well, and that is if you let the messages get stale – um, if you don't have communication stakeholders involved and you're really not maintaining or updating the content, like all three of those things just create an environment where the content on screen is pretty. And in fact, there's all sorts of, you know, contrast in the text and the imagery is beautiful and it does actually convey something, but it's the same message that's been up there for weeks on end. It or only, months. Yeah, it only takes a day or two before people really start to tune it out. And then once people start to tune out your platform, it's very difficult to get them back. Right, because they don't trust it. That's correct. And, yeah. and it doesn't matter if you're responsible for websites or digital signs, that's those same rules of thumb apply because you know people visit a site once and if it's not compelling or it doesn't change the next day or day after that, it becomes boring, right? And people right. go somewhere else. And you can make the argument, yes, but we have so much stuff there. And you're like, yeah, it's a little bit like, you know how you pay $120 a month for 200 cable channels, and yet everything that you want to see you've already seen, it's all just reruns? It's the same idea. Yep. You know, there's nothing fresh here. This is why people continually add more things to their cable packages, because they want more. They want new. They want variety. They want something interesting. They want something fresh. Yep. And the, the last one here, you know, we, we in some of these discussions we've had, we've talked about... Things like, you know, future proofing technology and that kind of stuff. But beyond future proofing technology, we run into this quite often. And this is the tipping point for a failure when the system and its utilization had been really, really well done for many years. But yet there's all of a sudden there's turnover in staff. Right. Ah. And so a key person leaves. And not only does the key person leave, but then other people leave or they change roles or responsibilities and they move um, within the organization. Or they graduate if they're a university student. Sure. Yeah. And so now there's nobody to take over and you've not planned for training. You've actually had no succession planning whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so now someone's forced to adopt the system who in many cases is completely out of touch with it. They're not a lot of an evangelist at all. In fact, they don't get it and or they don't want to get it because they have other things to do and you're just adding this to my day job. So, mm. you know, not planning uh, for the future in terms of who's going to own it, run it, and live it, that's a, a certainly a point for failure, mm. despite many years of success before that day. Right. So it's not just anticipate that one day you're going to have to get a new display. You might have to have a, a whole new set of people someday running the system. Yep. All right. right. So that's how, straight from the horse's mouth, if I may call you a horse, Sean Matthews, president and CEO of Physics, telling us, 13 ways we can absolutely screw up a digital signage deployment. So if you're hell-bent on failure, do those things. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Derek. Hey, want more free stuff? Then head to the resources section of physics.com for free masterclass guides, blogs, videos, and more to help you with your digital signs. Please share, subscribe, and leave a review of this episode and connect with us on social media.